Pastors Brad and Misty have been teaching a series called Let's Grow Already. Maybe you've been trying to apply those principles and then looked at someone else's life, maybe our pastors or other great leaders, and wondered, how can I ever get from where I am now to the faith and discipline that they have? Have you thought, I want to be Christ-like, but it seems impossible to reach? It is easy to get discouraged if we look at where we want to be and not feel we're making progress. We want you to know it is possible to get from here to there, and that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today in part five of Let's Grow Already, From Here to There. I heard the story of how the Niagara Falls suspension bridge was built, and it is such a neat story. Permission was given for the formation of two bridge companies to construct a bridge at or near the falls. In autumn of 1847, companies chose the narrowest point from shoreline to shoreline. The engineers had to find a way to pull the first cables across the gorge, which was 800 feet apart. The water was too dangerous to try to pull cables across by boat. Helicopters weren't invented yet. So the solution they came up with was to fly a kite. A contest was held with a $5 prize to see who could fly a kite across the Niagara Gorge. A young American boy named Homan Walsh won the contest on the second day of the competition, flying his kite from the Canadian shore. The string of his kite was fastened to a tree on the American shoreline, and it was pulled across by a light cord attached. They later tried a heavier cord, then a rope, then a wire cable. And finally, they were able to pull a steel cable, and the construction began. It's easy to start our walk with the Lord and feel we aren't getting anywhere. But when we start making steps in the right direction, we are building that bridge, and we will make it to the other side. You know, the Bible shows us it's not our work, but God's work in us. Philippians 1.6 in the Passion Translation says, I pray with great faith for you. Because I'm fully convinced that the one who began this glorious work in you will faithfully continue the process of maturing you and will put his finishing touches to it until the unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ. We aren't alone in our efforts. I love how it says God started the work and is helping us get to the finish line. I heard Carrie Newhoff say, becoming a Christian is like getting married. Being a Christian is like being married. The hard work starts after the wedding. You know, Josh and I had been just friends for years, but I knew the very moment his feelings towards me changed. And it absolutely changed his behavior. He started opening doors for me. He would surprise me with flowers. And sometimes he would call and leave me messages while I was at work, just saying he was thinking about me. When we go all in with Jesus, everything changes. Philippians 2, 12 through 13 says, Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. God actually changes our desires. I know it can sound like a contradiction to one minute say it's not our work, but God working in us. And the verse before it begins by saying to work hard. We still have a part to play. He gave us a free will to choose him or not. But when we choose him, he gives us an excitement for doing what pleases him. Like in a marriage, we may not always feel like putting in the work, but it is worth it when we do. And it can be pretty miserable if we don't. There will still be things we struggle to work through, but God is wanting to help us every step of the way. I remember when God changed me. I know some of you won't believe it, but I was not a people person. I didn't really think about how what I did affected others. And when God got a hold of me, it was just like the Grinch who stole Christmas. My heart grew three sizes that day, and I felt it. I had a love for others that I didn't have before. It changed my whole personality. I wanted to hug everyone, and I wanted to help others, which was not even something I was asking God for. He changed my desires, but I still have to follow Him and put in the work. I'm going to do my very best to live for God the best way I can. I love 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. It says, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. 
but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I, might, I myself might be disqualified. I will do my best, but then I'm going to trust that God is with me to help me all along the way. Josh Mayo said, Authentic Christianity is more about direction than perfection. Romans 3 says we have all fallen short of the glory of God. None of us are perfect, but continue heading in the right direction toward the goal. God doesn't expect us to be perfect, but He expects our perfect effort. So today we want to give you two things you're going to need to go from here to there. The first is to listen for His voice. I don't know about everyone else, but the biggest struggle in our relationship is when we don't listen to each other. Or more specific, when really I don't listen. <laughs> it's the same with our relationship with the Lord. The longer I have walked with Him, the more I hear and recognize His voice and His leading. But if I'm too busy or distracted by the situations around me, I miss it. Pretty much everyone uses a GPS system when they go on trips, right? It's really handy because it helps by telling you the directions that are coming and when to make turns, ending in getting to the place you've desired to be. But if you get distracted and miss one turn, you could end up in some places you never wanted to be. John 10, 1 through 5 says, Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. We can't follow his leading if we don't hear him telling us where to go. Proverbs 3, 5 through 8 says, Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. You know, it really comes down to trust and surrender. What does it mean to trust and surrender? It means God has full access to everything about you. It means I want to please him more than myself. So if I have to choose between what I want and what he has for me, I choose his way. It means I give him control of my behavior, how I treat people, how I treat my wife and kids. And when, I, when he speaks to me and challenges me on something, I surrender, surrender it to him and make changes. So the next time you want to road rage on someone and God says, no, that's not who you are anymore, change your behavior. This is like, where it talks in Romans 12 2, God transforming your mind. He's curating in you a new default behavior. You know, Pastor Misty pointed out last week that we all have blind spots. We have to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal those to us. So how will they know if they're really hearing God's voice? The Bible is our standard. God isn't going to tell you to do something that goes against his word. In fact, Hebrews 4 12 says, that God's word is alive and active, and I love that. I have to examine my life in the light of God's word. You know, it's a lot like a mirror. A mirror gives a true reflection. It gives a true reflection of what we currently look like. So when I first get up in the morning and look in the mirror, I see a guy who needs to take a shower or do something that, to make myself presentable. That's how God's word guides us into being more like Christ. It challenges us and it reveals to us at times things and behaviors we can adjust so we live a life more pleasing to him. Whenever I disagree with the Bible, the Bible wins. I have to assume that I'm wrong and God's word is right. You know, when Jace was in elementary school, he was convinced that his teacher was wrong about 12 a.m. and 12 p.m. It didn't make sense to him that 11 a.m. in the morning would then change to 12 p.m. at noon. No matter what we did, no matter what we said or his teacher said, was going to change his mind. He was sure he was right, but that didn't change the fact that he was still wrong. It is the word of God. 
My words are not greater than his. The living written word of God has authority over our lives. Psalms 119, 9 through 11 says, How can a young person stay on a path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You know, it will always be a never ending process. And I think that's why Paul says in Philippians 3, 13 and 14, No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. You know, once we know what he wants us to do, it comes down to obedience. You're not going to go from here to there just by listening to him only. You have to obey his voice. But what happens when you, when you know what he wants you to do, it gives, God gives you a boldness and a confidence. I'm no longer guessing which path to take. It's, it's no longer just a stab in the dark. He knows us inside and out. You know, we doubt, question, and often choose an alternative path. You know, one of the craziest things as parents and frustrations is when our kids disregard our advice. I was giving Shana some advice when she was in high school, and she told me she would just have to learn the hard way, and I had to laugh. I know I learned the hard way at that age, but I don't remember realizing I was doing it the hard way. We have to recognize we don't see and know it all. God has a totally different perspective. I heard about a man and his son on an airplane. His little boy looked down and said, Look, Dad, little people, little houses, little trees. From our view, our problems look like skyscrapers, but God is looking down and sees them as little problems. I think we have to get to the point where we just say, God, I'm going to trust you. And the bottom line is, it does, does us no good to hear God's voice if we have no intention of obeying and following it. James 5.1 says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. The first place we need to go for guidance is the Lord. You know, not even our pastors, even though they're great, or a counselor, or a friend. It's, we need to seek him first and give him an opportunity to guide you. You know, early on in our <coughs> ministry, we had lots of advice for parents. We were quick to tell them everything we had learned in youth ministry classes at Bible college. Even though we didn't have teenagers at that time. We learned that we could come alongside them, pray with them, and point them to the principles in God's word. But we realized... God wasn't going to give us the plan for their life. He was going to give the plan to them. It's like this cat in the picture. At times, we can only see one option until we seek the Lord and he shows us another way out. You know, surrendering to God reminds me a lot of a house. You know, a house has many rooms. And if we're honest, like when, if you were to come into our house, there's some rooms that probably aren't presentable. But there's a few rooms that you could walk in at any time. And most of the time, they look perfect. You know, so, uh, but imagine if God showed up at your house, you know, and you let him in your house and, and he walks in your room. And he's like, this room looks great. You know, Jesus is sitting there in your living room. He's like, this room looks great. Hey, show me more of your house. And you begin to get a little nervous because not every room in your house looks the best, but you take him into the, the next room that you know looks good. Maybe it's the kitchen, you know, and he's like, this room looks great. Everything looks in place. It looks, it looks perfect. He's like, but I need to see more of your house. And then you begin to say, you know what, Jesus, the rest of our house, the rooms don't look perfect. They don't look, they don't, they're, they're just kind of messy. And Jesus is like, if you want me to be the Lord of your, your house, I need access to all the rooms. And you may be like, Jesus, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed to show you this room. But Jesus says, if you want me to be Lord of your house, I need access to all the rooms but Jesus, I'm kind of embarrassed to show you those rooms. There's, there's things in there that no one else knows about. And Jesus says, but if you want me to be Lord of your life, I need access to all the rooms. I need the keys to all the rooms. I need access to everything because I don't wanna, even though that room may be a mess, if I'm not in it with you, I can't lead you out of it. And I want to leave you lead you out of the mess. I want to lead you out of the hurt. I want to lead you 
out of the struggles that you've had and into the life that I've called you to be. Jesus wants full access. He, he, he doesn't want to just be your savior. He wants to be your Lord. He wants to bring you out of the struggles, out of the mess, out of everything you've been going through and into the beautiful life that he has for you. You know, I want to pray with you right now. But before I do, Jesus wants all access. And maybe you're watching today and you say, man, I really haven't given him all access to everything about my life. I haven't, I haven't told anyone about the hurts that I have. I haven't told anyone about the messy issues in my life. But today, I want to give Jesus full access to those. I want him to lead me out of those. What I want you to do right now is just simply type all in in the chat. God, I'm giving you all access. I'm going all in with you. I'm giving you access to every single room in my half, house, no matter what it looks like, no matter what, what, the, what the mess is in or, or all the problems I have. God, I want you to be a part of all of it. And so today, I'm going all in with you. I want you to take me from where I am now, from here to there, to the life that you have for me. So let's pray right now. Just repeat this prayer with wherever you are. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, today, today, I choose, I choose to make you, to make you the Lord of my life. The Lord of my life. Come into my heart. Come into my heart. Be my savior. Be my savior. And my Lord. And my Lord. God, I give you full access. God, I give you full access to everything I am. To everything I am. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe that you died on a cross for me. That you died on a cross for me. And that you rose from a de- from the dead. And that you rose from the dead. And that one day soon. And that one day soon. You're coming back for me. You're coming back for me. So Jesus. So Jesus. I make you everything to me. I make you everything to be me. Be the Lord of my life. Be the Lord of my life. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen.